This lesson is about the difference between loudness and intensity of sound. We're going to learn that loudness is a physiological sensation and is therefore subjective, whereas intensity is a physical measurement. Later on in the presentation, I will also talk about how loudness uh, is perceived by your ear and how uh, sounds that are too loud might be damaging to your hearing. So here's a jet airplane and a butterfly. Which of these is loud? Well, the jet airplane would be much louder than the butterfly, but they do both make sounds. How do our ears tell the difference between those two sounds? Loudness of a sound is a qualitative characteristic. We can say it's very loud, very soft, something in between. In other words, it is a subjective uh, judgment call. If you are a physicist and you want to compare two sounds, you would probably measure their intensity. So intensity is a physical characteristic that you can use some sort of meter for to, to measure. Uh, technically what it is is the power carried by sound waves over a given amount of area. It's also got a direction to it. It's a vector quantity in that sense. So sound intensity is an objective measurement. It's proportional to the square of the amplitude of the sound wave, how far back and forth the particles move while the wave is being transmitted. Uh, it, is, it does have to be determined with equipment, one or more pieces of equipment. Loudness, on the other hand, is something that we hear with our ears and perceive in our brain. It's a subjective judgment based on physiological response. Obviously, they're related to each other. A more intense sound will generally be heard as a louder sound. But what is that exact relationship? Well, it turns out it's not very exact. And loudness, in fact, can be perceived differently just by different people. Technically speaking, sound intensity is found by making two measurements, pressure and particle velocity, how fast the particles that are carrying the sound are moving. So um, shown here is an equation for sound intensity, pressure times particle velocity, where pressure would be measured in the metric unit of the Pascal, and velocity would be measured in meters per second. But if you take that um, pressure, Pascals, and that velocity meter per second and put them into a, a mixed unit, PA times M over S, uh, if you take the Pascal apart, it's got some force and distance and time involved there. So it turns out that what that um, actually translates to is a power per area, watts per meter squared unit. Watts is the measure of power. You might not remember that, but we had a lesson on that much earlier uh, last fall. Power is work divided by time. So how much force and distance and time is involved, as well as how much area is involved in making that sound. So to determine sound intensity then, you would need some sort of equipment, something to measure pressure in the uh, area. Um, sound pressure is often used as sort of a substitute rather than making the actual intensity measurement. Most of the time, all we need is a microphone. It can measure the pressure of a wave that strikes it, and then that can be displayed in some sort of waveform in a digital instrument. If you play an instrument, a band instrument, or a guitar or something like that, you may actually be familiar with the sound tuner. Not only can it display the frequency characteristics of a sound, but a lot of them can also display the loudness characteristics, the intensity by using the microphone. So 
So intensity is a physical set of measurements, really, watts per meter squared. You can use a sound intensity probe. Uh, the PU probe has a microphone to sense the pressure, and it has a particle velocity sensor, and so it can do the calculation of intensity for you. There is another type of sound intensity probe which actually uses two microphones. They sort of face each other, and it can determine pressure um, by sort of a, a, a mathematical translation. But anyway, we're not going to be doing anything with that. I just want you to understand that if you ever hear the word sound intensity, we're talking about something that you would have to have specialized equipment to measure. Sound pressure is related to intensity. It's, it's um, involved in the calculation of intensity, and it's a pretty good substitute for measuring intensity. And all you need for that is a simple microphone and then some sort of digital uh, way of displaying that information. Loudness, again, is a judgment call. You use your ears and your brain, okay? So intensity, pressure, and loudness are all related. They just aren't exactly the same thing. And you really shouldn't use those terms as synonyms. Now, how loud does a sound have to be for us to hear it? How loud does a sound have to be before we can't hear it or, or it hurts our ears? It turns out that we actually have a, quite a large range of hearing capabilities. Um, the so-called threshold of human hearing, a person with really excellent hearing could hear a one kilohertz tone um, sound level and that's assuming that you're, you know, in some sort of a soundproof booth, so no other sound is interfering. That's equivalent to, let's say, a mosquito buzzing about 10 feet from your ear, okay? So if it were perfectly silent around you, you could probably hear that little bug flying around about 10 feet away if you had really excellent hearing. That's called the threshold of human hearing. At the threshold of human hearing, the sound waves would vibrate your eardrum less than, than the complete diameter of an atom. Now, I want you to understand how sensitive that is. If we could hear even just a little bit better, it might be kind of annoying because then every atom that bounced off of our eardrums would vibrate our eardrums enough that we would be hearing, you know, um, much softer sounds than mosquitoes buzzing 10 feet away. And so it might be uh, kind of annoying to be constantly bombarded by the thrumming of, of atoms all around us. Now, while the official unit of pressure in the metric system is the Pascal, sound pressure has a different unit that is traditionally used. Uh, it's called the bell, or we more commonly use a decibel because um, that actually gives us a little bit more sensitive measurement. The bell is named after Alexander Graham Bell because this was originally applied to signal loss in the telephone when it was invented over 100 years ago. So the threshold of human hearing is designated as zero on the decibel scale. Okay, so decibels, zero, that's your threshold of hearing. Then in this table, you can see a variety of other decibel levels. And um, what you don't see is that this is not a simple linear scale. It's not like a ruler or a speedometer. You know, on a ruler, if you measure, say, um, 10 centimeters, and then you measure 20 centimeters, that 20 is twice as long as 10. That's not the way a logarithmic scale works. So let me talk about that just a little bit. If you start at zero with a threshold of normal hearing, and then you go up to 10 decibels, that 10 decibels means that in the physics sense, the sound intensity level just increased by a factor of 10. So a sound of 10 decibels is 10 times as intense as a sound of zero. 20 decibels is not twice as intense as 10 decibels. It's 10 times. 
See, every 10 decibels increases your intensity by a factor of 10. So if you had a sound of 20 decibels and you compared it to a sound of zero decibels, that would be 10 times 10 or 100 times as intense in the physical sense. Similarly, if you had a 60 decimal sound, that would be 10 times as loud as a 50 decibel sound. It would be 100 times as loud as a 40 decibel sound, 1,000 times as loud as a 30 decibel sound, and so forth. So basically, the if you take the 30 and um, the 30 decibel difference between 60 and, and 30 decibels, okay, you got a 30 decibel difference. Divide that by 10, you got a 3. Basically, that is the exponent of 10. That's your factor difference between those two. 10 to the third would be a thousand times difference between 30 decibels and 60 decibel sounds. Let's watch this little video and you can get an idea of some of the sound levels that we're talking about here. This is my new dishwasher. We had so many home cooked meals and so many dirty dishes during the COVID-19 quarantine that my old dishwasher gave up the ghost and we had to buy a new one. I bought a very good dishwasher that claims it will only reach an intensity of around 40 decibels. Now 40 decibels may sound like a lot, but my voice right now is at about 60 decibels. That's 100 times more intense than the sound of my dishwasher. So the decibel system was invented as a way of measuring signal loss in telephones and it was named in honor of Alexander Graham Bell, the inventor of the telephone. But today we use decibels, one-tenth of a bell instead of bells. And if someone tells you to lower your decibels, they're asking you to be quieter. 40 decibels is roughly equivalent to what you might hear in a good library setting or maybe uh, the sound of somebody sleeping. And like I said, the conversational voice that I'm trying to use right now as I'm taping has a 60 decibel or thereabouts uh, intensity. That means that if you translated the longitudinal waves making the sound into a transverse wave, the wave of my voice would be 10 times taller than the wave of my dishwasher. That's a pretty good dishwasher. I hope it was worth the investment, but at least I can talk while it's working. So um, what I showed you that for is just to give you an idea that most of the sounds around you are somewhere between about 40 and 80 decibels at any given time. Okay, just to get an idea of where we are on the decibel level. But we can hear softer sounds than that and we can hear louder sounds than that. But once they get too loud, they actually start to become painful. But it's a logarithmic scale, so the numbers can be a little bit misleading for our linear brains. Uh, if you compare zero decibels to, say, 120 decibels, then that is a uh, 10, let's see, was that a million, billion, 10 trillion times difference in sound level intensity, okay, between what we can hear in a, a sound booth versus what we can hear at a concert, 10 trillion times difference. That's why we need this logarithmic scale. Let me put it to you in a, in a slightly different way. Let's pretend like we were going to make a graph of this. And if we were making um, a scale of 10 decibels equals one centimeter high, well, it would turn out that our graph would have to be 8 million miles high in order to reach the 120 decibel level. Okay? So when you have a huge range of numbers, 
it's often useful to translate it into a logarithmic scale because that reduces it down to a manageable picture-like um, uh, scale that your brain can interpret a little better. But you have to learn how to use the logarithmic scale. Your math teacher may have been bringing this up in math class, and you may wonder why you need it. This is why you need it for, for situations where there's a huge difference between one end and the other end of a spectrum, the logarithmic scale translates it into a way that makes it much more manageable. So the logarithm can use different powers. We are talking about logarithms to the base 10. And if we use a logarithmic scale to make our graph and we set one centimeter equals 10 decibels, then the entire range would only be 130 centimeters high, not 8 million miles high. So that's 10 billion times shorter than the linear scale that we would have to use. So sound intensity is a physical measurement. Um, technically, the units are watts per meter squared, but we often substitute sound pressure as a way of measuring sound intensity. It's only half of an, the intensity that we need, but we still use sound pressure, and the pressure is often used a decibel level. So generally speaking, uh, how does that relate to what we hear? Well, again, our ears are not perfect. We can't tell one sound is 10 times louder than another or more intense than another. Instead, the way our brain translates it is about a 10 decibel intensity increase we hear as about twice as loud, subjectively speaking, okay? So a busy street or a conversational voice of about 60 decibels, and then you start shouting, um, you know, at 70 decibels, to us that'll sound about twice as loud, even though it's actually 10 times more intense in the physical sense. Our ears are not perfect, as I have emphasized several times, and they are more sensitive to some frequencies, frequencies than others. So um, what I just said about for every 10 decibels is about twice as loud doesn't actually apply to all frequencies. It's only a rough approximation. You may have noticed on the chart that once you get up around 110, 120 or so, we have what's called the threshold of pain. That's the point at which it starts to hurt our ears and starts to become very uncomfortable to hear a sound. If you go above 130 decibels uh, or even 120 for some frequencies, it not only becomes painful, but can start to become permanently damaging to your hearing. So 120, 130 decibels is roughly equivalent to being close to uh, a, a jet engine as it's starting to take off or close to the big speakers. If you ever go to like the Thunder over Louisville and they have these huge speakers set up, don't get close to them because that can actually permanently damage your hearing. That's going to be a focus of the remainder of my talk here. So what I want to do now is watch part of a video that I signed earlier. Um, you watch the first half of it. We're going to watch sort of about the not quite last half of it. So let me get off of this. I think I already have it set up. And let's go. You can't hear them at all. Another aspect that shapes sound is its loudness. When you increase the intensity of a sound, you increase its loudness and vice versa. We've talked about the intensity of a wave before. It's the wave's power over its area measured in watts per meter squared. We've also said that the intensity of a wave is proportional to the wave's amplitude squared. And the further you are from the source of a wave, the lower its intensity by the square of the distance between you and the source. And just as there's a range of pitches that humans can hear, there's also a range of sound wave intensity that humans can hear comfortably. Generally, people can safely hear sounds from about one picowatt per square meter up to one watt per square meter, which is about as loud as a rock concert if you're near the speakers. The sound waves coming from a jet plane that's 30 meters away, for example, probably have an intensity of around 100 watts per meter squared. Now, I don't know if you've ever been that close to a roaring jet plane, but there is a reason why the people that work 
on the tarmac at airports use those heavy duty headphones. Below one picowatt per square meter, sounds are just too soft for us to detect them. And although we will hear sounds above a watt per square meter, they tend to hurt our ears. But here's a weird thing about loudness and intensity. It's not a linear relationship. Generally, a sound wave needs to have 10 times the intensity to sound twice as loud to us. This relationship holds true as long as the sound is towards the middle of the range of the frequencies we can hear. So instead of directly measuring the loudness of sounds by their intensity, we use units called decibels which are based on bells. Bells convert a sound wave's intensity to a logarithmic scale, where every notch on the scale is 10 times higher than the previous one. The scale starts off with an intensity of one picowatt per square meter, corresponding to zero bells. So a sound that's one bell is 10 times as intense as a sound that's zero bells. And a sound that's two bells is 10 times as intense as a sound that's one bell, but 100 times as intense as a sound that's zero bells. Measuring everything in bells can be kind of annoying because sometimes you want to talk about sounds that are, say, 3.4 bells without having to deal with decimal points. That's why most of the time you'll hear the loudness of a sound described using the more familiar decibel unit a tenth of a bell. To find the loudness of a sound when you know its intensity, you take the base 10 logarithm of its intensity over the reference intensity of one picowatt per square meter. Then you multiply that number by 10 to get the sound's decibel level. We can use this equation to convert the intensity of that noisy rock concert, which we said was one watt per square meter, to decibels. First, we take the base 10 log of one watt per square meter over one picowatt per square meter. Now, one divided by one times 10 to the minus 12 is just one times 10 to the 12. So what we really want to do is take the base 10 log of one times 10 to the 12 or a trillion watts per meter squared. What a logarithm asks you to do is find the power that you would need to raise the base to in order to get the number in parentheses. In other words, we're looking for the exponent of 10 that would equal one times 10 to the 12, which is just 12. To finish off the calculation of decibels from intensity, we multiply that value 12 by 10 to get the decibel level of the rock concert where you were standing, 120 decibels. Ow. You'll notice that as the source of a sound moves closer to you, it gets louder. And as it moves away, it gets softer. That makes sense, since the closer you are to the source of the sound, the greater the intensity of the wave that hits your ear. But have you ever noticed that the... Okay. At that point, she starts talking about the Doppler effect, which we've already covered, so we won't do that. Now, I showed that mostly for you math lovers out there. Um, if you want to know a little bit more about the mathematics behind this, I'm not going to require anybody to do those calculations, but um, it's, it's a very, very intense set of mathematics. And um, if you ever do use logarithms, you don't always have things like 1 times 10 to the 12th. You can have, you know, 1.2 and, and, and 0.9 and stuff like that. So it's a little bit more complicated than was shown here. What I want to switch to now is talking more about how the ear itself works. So again, I'm going to give you sort of an overview and then show you a little video that will repeat some of the information. I'm just trying to make sure that you've heard it because this is important to me that you take care of your ears. So basically sound is transmitted as this longitudinal wave and those waves um, come at you from your environment and strike your eardrum. So the outer ear is actually shaped a little in such a way to kind of help channel certain frequencies, especially down into your ear. But ultimately what gets the whole thing started is when the eardrum starts to vibrate. So when the eardrums vibrate, it, one, it's attached to a tiny little bone that's attached to another tiny little bone that's attached to another little bone. So those bones of the middle ear really small, I mean, the smallest bones in your whole body vibrate back and forth. They're transmitting the vibration to a uh, third part of your ear, which we refer to collectively as the inner ear. Now, one of the things that happens in that transmission between the, between the eardrum and then the inner ear is the force of the vibration is actually multiplied. It's an area um, thing. We haven't really talked about how this would happen, but maybe when we get back in person, we can do a demonstration to show you how force can be multiplied very easily by reducing the area over the transmission. It's basically an increase in pressure. If you reduce the area, which is in the denominator, it increases the total force. Anyway, so now a little membrane in the uh, inner ear called the cochlea starts to vibrate, and that vibrates 
a fluid in your inner ear. That fluid vibrates back and forth and it in turn vibrates some cells and attached to those cells are some little hair like projections. We, we call them hair cells actually. Uh, collectively, if you take all the hair cells together, we call it the organ of Corti, but that's, that's not necessarily that important. But the point is, is that in, in all these little hair cells that vibrate back and forth, when they vibrate, they actually release um, some potassium ions. This starts to become chemistry then, instead of physics. And the potassium ions cause some, um, let's call them neurotransmitters, some chemicals to, to start moving inside the uh, cells. And those neurotransmitters signal basically that um, electrical signals need to be sent to the brain. And so these electrical signals get sent to your brain and then your brain interprets the sound. So how does your brain know what sounds to interpret? Well, it depends on which of those hair cells are sending the signal and how much signal are they sending? Okay. So which cells signal tells it what the frequency is and how much they're vibrating back and forth tells it what the intensity or the loudness is. So electrical impulses in your brain are interpreted by your brain to, to be certain types of sounds. So let's watch this little video and it'll give you a, basically a visual uh, animated video of what I just told you. So let's review it again. Many of us take for granted a very extraordinary organ, our ears. To understand the ear, we need to understand what sound is. The speakers you are listening to right now are vibrating, flexing in and out, causing a wave of pressure through the air. The frequency of these waves, or the speed at which the sound creating surface moves back and forth, affects the pitch of the sound. The level of air pressure in each wave is directly related to how loud the sound is. The outer part of our ear catches these waves. It faces forward and has a specially designed structure of curves helping us to determine the direction of the sound and also emphasize the frequencies used in human speech. Now that the sound waves are caught, they travel through the ear canal and strike against our eardrum, a thin membrane about 10 millimeters wide. Now that we receive the sound, the middle ear transfers this energy. The smallest bones in your body the malleus, incus, and stapes start in motion. The malleus is attached to the eardrum, and as the sound travels along, the force is amplified by leverage until it arrives at the stapes, which acts like a reversed piston, creating waves in the fluid of the inner ear. The most significant increase in pressure is caused by pneumatic amplification. The face of the stapes has a surface area of about 3.2 square millimeters, while the eardrum has a surface area of 55 square millimeters. Using this, along with leverage through the malleus and incus, the final pressure is 22 times greater than when the sound first arrived. Now we come to the most complicated part of the hearing, the cochlea. In reality, it is coiled up, but it is easier to understand straightened out. There are actually three chambers inside but let's take a look at the central part. The stapes is causing pressure waves to travel through the structure. Along the inside wall is about 20 to 30,000 reed-like fibers. As the waves move along, they encounter fibers with the correct resonant frequency and energy is released. These fibers aren't actually what give us the signal that we heard something. There is a special structure next to these fibers containing hair cells. When the fibers resonate, they cause the hair cells to move which then sends an electrical impulse to the cochlear nerve and onto the brain. Certain pitches of sound will resonate in specific locations and louder sounds will cause more hair cells to move. Our brain interprets all this raw data, making it possible to enjoy things like music or an engaging conversation. Just to think that all of this is happening in your head right now at full speed. This is just one of the amazing systems found in the human body that go far beyond our humble human understanding.
so we haven't talked about resonance yet, but that's how the different um, fiber cells are able to vibrate as they resonate with the particular frequencies oops, received. What I really wanted to focus on, and, and a lot of what I've been trying to build up to over the last four or five lessons, is to talk about this, about how the ear works and how you need to protect, protect your ears. Okay. Um, if you damage any part of your ear, it can result in hearing loss. And um, that can happen because you inherit a particular disease or maybe you get a, say, a viral disease that can do damage to your, to your ear. Those things, I'm not sure that you could do anything about them, okay, as far as preventing them. There might be help for, for uh, various types of hearing loss that you can go and get from a doctor. And so I encourage you to get a checkup if you think that you're, you're suffering from any sort of hearing loss. But what I wanted to talk about in particular is the fact that you can damage your ear just from listening to loud noises. And that's something that you can prevent a lot of times. For example, in the video earlier, the lady said, uh, you know, when you work at an airport, they wear these headphones, the, these ear coverings. A lot of our students at Mel High School get jobs at UPS. If you get around one of those airplanes, please wear your ear coverings. OK, they're given to you for a reason. And if you see people who aren't wearing them, and they say, oh, it doesn't hurt me anymore. They've lost part of their hearing. And that is a, a sad situation. So a single burst of sound above an intensity of 130 decibels can actually destroy parts of that organ of corti. It can destroy some of your hair cells. And even listening to just loud sounds of say 85 to 90 decibels or more over long periods of time, that's what we mean by chronic, can damage your hearing forever. All right. So you need to stay away from loud noises, especially constant loud noises. If you work in a workplace that is very loud, like one of these Amazon warehouses where they've got conveyor belts going all the time, you need to wear hearing protection. You need to take it seriously. It's like wearing a mask during the pandemic. It might be annoying, but it's for your own good. It's for your long term health. Unfortunately, the damaged hair cells of the organ of corti in humans do not regenerate. So if you listen to a very loud sound or you listen to chronic loud sounds and you damage some of your hair cells, they're damaged forever. That's what is so concerning to me is that you young people don't understand that you've only got two ears and they can be hurt and they can be hurt permanently. Even if you, if you go to one loud rock concert or uh, in particular, one thing that really um, a lot of you might be doing is just listening to loud music just by using headphones of some sort. If you've ever left a concert or a um, sporting event or thunder over Louisville or taken off your headphones and you hear a ringing sound in your ears, you may have just experienced permanent hearing damage. Now it may not be noticeable. It depends on what frequency range it's in, whether or not it's going to bother you, I guess. But I'm telling you that exposure to loud sounds and consequent damage to the inner ear is um, one of the reasons why you see old people on television often portrayed as not being able to hear very well. Okay. Once you lose part of the frequency range of your hearing, you don't get it back at least not without help. You can't grow those cells back. Now, I will tell you this. Other animals can, in fact, grow those hair, hair cells back. Uh, some birds and, and um, reptiles are actually able to repair some damage to their inner ear. And so there is research. There's hope that we might be able to do that at some point. There's genetic engineering that's always possible. But right now, if you do damage to your ears, they have to implant some sort of mechanical device in order to, to help you hear. And again, that's a good thing. It's great that, you know, people can be helped, but it'd be better in my opinion, 
you just avoided loud sounds to begin with. So you didn't need to go to the doctor and pay for a lot of expensive equipment. So building up to say this, you see those earbuds, do you wear them? Dr. Kemp recommends that you stop wearing them. They can do da permanent damage to your ears. I, I really don't understand, in fact, how um, people like the, the Apple earbud uh, man manufacturers haven't yet been sued for this because what most people do is they turn these um, earbuds on. And if you're listening in a quiet environment, it's fine. So that's fine. But what they do is then they go out somewhere loud and they turn them up even more and they turn them up even more so that they can hear. You get on a school bus and you turn them up so you can hear. You get in your car and you turn them up so you can hear. You go out to a, a crowd somewhere and you turn them up so you can hear. You could be damaging your hearing by doing that, folks. You need to be careful. OK. Um, I don't want you to hurt your eardrums. And so you need to be aware of this. Like I said, if you take off your earbuds and you hear a ringing noise, it's possible that you have just damaged your, your hearing. And that's a really sad situation. One last uh, note about the ringing in the ears. Every now and then, you know, I hear a, a ringing sound in my ears and that's just kind of normal. That's, that's your ear just making adjustments, your brain trying to figure things out. But if you hear a constant ringing in your ears, it can actually drive you crazy. And so you especially need to go to an audiologist or some kind of a, a ear specialist and, and get that checked out because it is not normal for um, young people in particular to hear a constant ringing in your ear. That is not normal. You need to go get that fixed. So be careful with your ears. Um, it'd be nice if you know, when you get older, you can hear your children cry and your grandbabies cry without having to, to wear extra hardware. Okay. So this is Dr. Kemp signing off for now and uh, good listening.